Rock climbing at a high level depends on something your body wasn't meant to do. As requested by a subscriber, we're going to review and critique Kyle Hill's viral video, 33% of climbing injuries are all the same, why? Which definitely piqued my interest as a physical therapist. This is why a full third of rock climbing injuries are exactly the same thing. A full 33% of all climbing injuries are the exact same thing. And I've got a lot to say about it, so this should be fun. Which hand technique do you think puts the most force on the smallest stuff in your hand? It's the crimp, which can be open, as you see here, or closed. Okay, so I think he's just trying to keep things simple for his non-climber audience here, but there are several ways to grip a crimp hold, including draped or dragged position, half crimp, closed crimp, full crimp, with each position changing the way our fingers handle force. This is important for understanding the way our fingers can get injured. For example, all positions rely heavily on the FTP tendon, but the half crimp places more load on the A2 pulley than the drag. For that reason, we need to be specific when discussing crimping and crimping related injuries. This hand and finger orientation is not found in any other sport, and as such, research has found that crimping leads to a specific injury called a pulley rupture, unique to rock climbers in its astonishing high frequency. Now we know what injury he's been talking about when he said, A full 33% of all climbing injuries are the exact same thing. While that is a pretty well-known injury for climbers and something I've seen numerous times in my practice, I'm a little suspicious of Kyle's claim here. There's no citation in the video description, but I did a bit of digging before filming this episode and found an article called Acute Hand and Wrist Injuries in Experienced Rock Climbers, which states, Finger tendon injuries were the most common, 33% of total number of injuries. I couldn't find any other research that backed up Kyle's claim, so I believe this is the study he was referencing. However, if we keep reading that sentence, we find something interesting. Finger tendon injuries were the most common, 33% of total number of injuries, which included non-specified finger tendon injuries, 25%, and those diagnosed with specific A2 pulley ruptures, 8%. So, 33% of the reported injuries were in the fingers, but only 8% were specifically diagnosed A2 pulley injuries. Keep in mind that the data used in this study does not necessarily reflect the climbing population as a whole, as it was a survey of 545 climbers who may or may not have reported an accurate diagnosis of their injury. Regardless, all the research I could find on this subject says that A2 pulley injuries make up significantly less than 33% of all climbing injuries. Why does any of that even matter? Why do I care if the number is 33% or 90% or 5%? Because I don't want to create undue fear in climbers and because accurate diagnosis is essential for overcoming injuries. If we go around thinking every time we have finger pain it must be an A2 rupture, that bias could cause us to ignore other potential causes. Overall, the lesson here is to make sure you read research thoroughly and realize your own biases can cause you to misinterpret information from time to time. This tendon, when activated by your muscle, pulls the finger down. But to do this efficiently and effectively, your body also has so-called pulleys, three of them per finger, which keeps your tendon close to the bone and able to be pulled down. So Kyle must have seen some like unclear or misleading information for this one. Our fingers have five annular pulleys and three to four, depending on what source you look at, cruciform pulleys. The number and placement of the tape strips in his demonstration is inaccurate, but his explanation of how the pulley works is great. Now, the climbing literature, there is a lot of climbing literature, says that I have to disagree there, though I wish that were true. We need much more climbing research. This A2 pulley right here, closest to your palm, this A2 pulley can handle about 380 to 400 newtons of force. Great, however, in the closed crimp position, as we've been talking about, this pulley right here is routinely asked to take at least 450 newtons and sometimes much more than that. Which means this pulley right here is being constantly overloaded when crimping while climbing and is close to failure. I really appreciate that Kyle wanted to provide research-based evidence for the A2 pulley failure. We need more of that in the climbing world. Unfortunately, I think he made a few mistakes when interpreting the research. As a result, the way he words this part of the video actually makes it a self-defeating argument. It kind of disproves itself. He says that our pulleys can handle 380 to 400 newtons, but then says the A2 is routinely subjected to much more than that during the closed crimp. Well, if that were the case, anyone using the closed crimp would rupture their A2 pulleys all the time. 
We don't need research to tell us that that is not what we actually observe in the real world. So we can conclude that at least part of this argument is incorrect, but which part? And is it actually Kyle's fault? If we look at the research he's likely referring to, we quickly see the first error. The study states a 70 kilogram climber using a one finger crimp may come to support 450 newtons with a single finger exceeding the maximum tolerable load for which an A2 pulley range is 380 to 4 newtons. I don't know about you, but I don't see people routinely crimping with one finger, especially in a closed crimp. Yeah. <sighs> Generally, we're crimping with three or four fingers, so the load does not go to just one finger, which is partly why we don't constantly exceed the threshold of our pulleys. So that's one reason Kyle's argument here is not quite right. However, there's actually a larger, much more significant problem we need to address. The research itself. There are actually several articles that mention the A2 pulley failure point being around 400 newtons. In fact, we even mention that number ourselves in our mega A2 pulley rehab video. However, like Kyle, we should have dug deeper. Those studies didn't come up with that data themselves. They're all referencing an older study that used cadavers, aka dead people, for their measurements. They didn't specify the age of the cadavers, but another similar study did, and the average age was 75 and a half years old. I think it's safe to assume that those A2 measurements probably aren't that applicable to younger active climbers. In fact, a 2020 article from Schweitzer notes that pulleys in vivo are likely much stronger than pulleys of aged in cadaver fingers in those studies. Age plays a huge role in how durable tissues are, and more importantly, it is well demonstrated that tissues adapt over time to the demands they encounter. In the actual article Kyle references, the authors postulate the load on a climber's pulleys could actually be around 800 to 1,000 newtons. Constantly subjecting our fingers to the high stress of climbing actually causes physiological changes that allow them to cope. Clauser et al. showed that the A2 pulleys of climbers are 50% thicker than non-climbers, and the middle phalanx of climbers was 100 to 150% thicker. Even our bones can adapt. In summary, we are decidedly not exceeding the limit of our pulleys on a routine basis. Finger geometry and forces puts way too much force on this pulley. It's why I've injured myself in the exact same way three different times. Based on what we know about how fingers move, it's unavoidable. We'll get to that later, but I hope at this point you're thinking, hmm, maybe that's not correct. So. This took me a year to get over. Yeah. In my experience as a working PT, it generally should not take this long to recover from a pulley injury unless the patient is not following a good rehab plan or is continuously exacerbating the issue. So if that's your experience, all the more reason to seek help from a professional. And if you are a climber yourself, I do have some advice. Listen to your body. Don't climb on sore fingers. Even though climbing is very addictive, take rest days. Strength train so you know how to efficiently move. And if you already had a pulley injury or you're worried about it, make sure you support your pulleys with external tape. The first three pieces of advice that he gives are great. The taping part, uh, highly debatable. But rather than go down another research rabbit hole, let's finish things off with the advice I would give someone in Kyle's position. One, pay attention to your climbing technique. Are you full crimping all the time? This is a risky habit some climbers get into early on, often to make up for weaknesses in other grip positions. This could increase your risk of pulley injury, so train yourself to be strong in half crimp, draped, and open-handed positions, and don't rely on the full crimp as a crutch. If you'd like to learn more about what causes pulley injuries and what to do about them, I'll put a link to our in-depth A2 pulley video in the description. Two, measure and assess your objective fitness step. By measuring things like finger, shoulder, and pull-up strength, you can get a sense of your current fitness level. Three, track your training consistently. Keep taking measurements over time. This will allow you to monitor your volume, identify trends, assess strengths and weaknesses, see your progress objectively, determine what works best for you, and even detect if you're at risk of injury. Four, have planned deload or rest weeks. Give your body a chance to heal. You don't need to push 100% of the time, all the time. Five, exercise patience. The body takes time to adapt, but it will adapt if you're smart with your training. Rushing will only make you go backwards. Number six, if you're unsure about how to do any of this, reach out to a skilled professional with climbing experience. Don't rely on gym hearsay to guide you. Climbing is still such a new sport when it comes to training and rehab data, so quality advice is just not always easy to come by. 
It's unfortunate this appears to have been Kyle's experience, but luckily new information is slowly becoming integrated into the climbing community's general pool of knowledge. If you want to speed up that process and help us reach our goal of creating the largest online library of free information for climbers, like this video and consider sharing it so people like Kyle can see it too. A special thank you to Kyle Hill for the time he put into making his video. If you have a video you're curious about or that you think needs a science review, tell us about it. Until next time, train, climb, send, repeat, and read that research thoroughly. Ooh, sick barrel, bruh. <laughs>